Next up will be Daniel Stone from here at the Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center. Daniel will uh, follow up on a topic that Paula brought up, which is the idea of using uh, endonucleases to target the integrated HIV genome. Um, and I think Dan will show us that uh, treatment with a single endonuclease can actually give rise to treatment resistant yet fully infectious uh, HIV. Thank you, Keith. For those of you who don't know, Keith didn't mention I work with Keith um, <laughs> here at Fred Hutch. And I'd like to thank Matt, Paula, and Abby for giving most of my introduction for me already. <clears throat> so today I'm going to talk to you guys about uh, the uh, emergence of treatment-resistant infectious HIV after genome-directed isolate and endonuclease therapy. Um, so I'd like to start with a general uh, kind of a little backwards here, I wanted to put the community slide up front just to kind of give you a general overview of what I'm going to talk about today. So the scientific hypothesis for the work that we've been doing in the lab towards HIV in this area is that if you introduce an enzyme that's able to specifically bind to and cleave the HIV DNA, that it can activate the HIV so it can no longer replicate. And the key findings that I'm going to show you are that during enzyme treatment, cleavage-resistant and infectious HIV can emerge in the cellular population, and that if you repeatedly treat this with additional enzymes, you can actually negate this resistance. Um, so why is this important? Well, this demonstrates that combination multiple enzyme therapies can be effective um, as DNA cleavage-based HIV treatments. And in relation to why is this uh, relative to cure, well, this uh, shows that disruption or mutation of the HIV genome could be used to permanently inactivate infected cells, basically preventing virus, replication, virus reactivation, which could provide a functional cure. Um, and why should we be excited? Well. I personally am excited by this uh, because I think we can avoid the problem of resistance during the development of new DNA-directed HIV therapies, such as the ones I'm talking about today. Sorry, I keep pushing this back in. So if we think about the, uh, you know, the premise behind the work that we're doing um, in the lab, we're, we're looking at HIV amongst other viruses, and really what we're trying to do is basically perform targeted gene disruption of essential genes within infected cell populations. Um, so if you imagine um, in... Uh, so I can't see this very well from here. If you imagine an HIV-infected cell, you have an integrated HIV provirus, which, forms, which is, uh, represents the template for all replication there. So uh, virus is able to replicate and pr produce infectious virus. Now, if you have an endonuclease that's able to specifically bind to the DNA sequence, it can use, introduce a DNA, uh, a double-stranded break within the DNA here. Now, in a normal cell, the process of non-homologous end joining is able to repair this so that you have a functional provirus and replication can continue. However, non-homologous end joining, as has been mentioned already today, um, can lead to imprecise, process, imprecise repair so that you get uh, mutations occurring and the gene becomes disrupted. Um, so you have two potential outcomes. In outcome A, the provirus is repaired, the virus can replicate. In outcome B, the essential, di essential gene no longer works and the virus cannot replicate. Now, it's important to note that in some of the experiments I'm going to show you, we can actually increase the frequency of uh, outcome B by introducing uh, a series of uh, end processing enzymes, such as one called TREX2, which was uh, working on, work done in Andy's lab. Um, it's shown that if you modify the ends right here during this process, you can actually skew it towards the outcome B and increase the uh, rate of mutagenesis. So I don't have to give you any background on the endonucleases. Thank you to the speakers ahead of me. Um, but the work I'm going to show you is based on a series of zinc finger nucleases that we've developed that target the protease, reverse transcriptase, and integrase genes within the HIV, pop, HIV polymerase gene. And uh, these are all essential for virus replication. So when we got these, the first thing we wanted to do was just find out whether they were, uh, well, when we generated these, the first thing we wanted to do was show that they were actually uh, able to cleave specifically in a specific manner. So we basically uh, did this simply by transfecting 293 cells with uh, plasmids that express um, zinc finger nucleases in, in combination with a plasma that contains uh, HIV sequences, PDHIV3. And then 48 hours later, we performed what's known as a T7 endonuclease mismatch cleavage assay to look for cleavage. And essentially what you're looking at here is you have a series of PCR products, um, and then when cleavage occurs, this demonstrates that you have mutations occurring, and you see bands, uh, bands appearing. So in the right-hand lanes of each of these four gels, you'll see that zinc finger pair one, two, three, and four, you have these cleavage products appearing that show that you have mutations occurring, which is really nice to see. Now, we also have uh, clonal article and sequencing uh, data to support this, but we're also able to quantify endonuclease uh, mediating mutation rates by digital PCR. And, uh, 
if you hang around for the poster session later on, Ruth Hall Sedlak from our group is going to be showing some data um, to uh, kind of demonstrate that we can actually uh, quantify very accurately the rate, rates of mutation relatively simply. So after we found that we were able to cleave the, cleave the DNA, we wanted to go ahead and show that we could see whether we had an effect on HIV replication. And to, to start off, we did this fairly simply by transfecting 293 cells with uh, the replication competent NL43 plasmid in combination with zinc finger expressing plasmids with or without TREX2. Um, and then after 48 hours, we did a P24 ELISA on supernatant to look for virion production. And then we used this uh, supernatant in, to form a TZMBL assay to the assay for infectious virus. Now, what we saw is that each of our four zinc fingers here, this is uh, control treated cells in the left two lanes. We actually got a reduction in the levels of virion production with all four of our zinc fingers. However, when we used the supernatants um, to infect TZMBL cells with equalized levels of P24, we only saw a knockdown in the levels of infectious virus in one of our four zinc fingers pairs. Now, I'm not showing you the data here today, but actually this is due to the levels of gene disruption. So zinc finger four had significantly higher levels in this particular experiment of gene disruption. So we wanted to see whether this was um, a result of the particular target site or whether it was level, due to the levels of disruption, just kind of confirm that. So what we did is from the sequencing data, we took um, for each of our zinc fingers, one, two, three, and four, we took mutations that we'd found in treated cells and introduced them back into the parental NL43 virus so that they either introduced frame shift mutations, um, introduced an amino acid, or in one case, reduced an amino acid. <coughs> we transfected these plasmas back into 293 cells and then took the virus to to assay it for levels of infectivity. And what we saw was that um, mutations introduced at each of the four target sites could completely knock out infectivity. However, we found that this one mutant, ZFN2 plus 3, retained infectivity at comparable levels to the wild type virus, which was quite interesting. So we next looked at the levels. We wanted to see whether mutation at these target sites would actually affect cleavage. Basically, uh, was the virus now resistant to treatment? So we took the uh, plasmids and put them in 293 cells and then treated them with their respective zinc finger nucleases. And we found that six of the different target sites were um, now resistant to cleavage by the zinc finger nucleases. However, two of them, zinc finger 4 plus 5, you can see this cleavage pattern too, this is a non-infectious virus. And then zinc finger 2 plus 3, this was interesting with the infectious mutant virus, could still be cleaved, albeit at lower levels. So we believe that this zinc 2 plus 3 is a partially resistant virus which it remains infectious. We wanted to look and see if this was actually um, something that would, you could see in a relevant cell line. So we took primary uh, activated human T cells and we infected them with increasing levels of P24 containing supernatant of, from uh, wild type NL43 or the mutant virus and then assayed uh, intracellular P24 levels to look as a readout for uh, infectivity. And you can see that you get a dose dependent in, uh, levels of P24 expression with both viruses but with the mutant virus, you do see it at a lower level, but it does retain infectivity in primary T cells. Finally, we wanted to see whether we could actually, um, whether the concept of having a dual therapy where you have multiple enzymes would actually negate this resistance. So we introduced two mutations, one in reverse transcriptase and one in integrase that had previously knocked out infectivity back into the uh, resistant mutant virus, CFN2 plus 3. We uh, produced virus supernatants and then tested infectivity first in TZMBL cells and then in primary human T cells. And the gist of this is that the wild type and the, NL4, the, wild type and the mutant virus could replicate in both cell types. But when you introduce these two mutants individually separately into the uh, resistant mutant, you knock out infectivity back to background levels. So what does this, what's the gist of the data here? So basically, um, pre as I mentioned previously, our initial hypothesis, we got two potential outcomes. Either the DNA is repaired and the virus is able to continue to replicate, or an outcome B, the gene is disrupted and you knock out replication. But what we see is there are a couple of different alternative outcomes. In outcome C, you get a mutation that actually enables replication and the target site becomes partially cleavage resistant, um, albeit at lower levels. And then outcome D, which is what we imagine would be a way forward with this therapy, is secondary mutations prevent virus are introduced and then this prevents virus replication. So I'd like to think, uh, finish off by uh, acknowledging the members of the Jerome Lab and the Schiffer Lab here at Fred Hutch who were involved in this, and particularly Hashana de Silva Felixke, who uh, this was basically a project between the two of us, and she performed a lot of this experiment here. And uh, I'll take any questions.
But the key word is delivery, as you put it, yeah. um, which is a big, big problem. <laughs> well, I've talk, we've talked about this with many people, Paula included, and um, whether you're looking at mRNA, whether you're looking at viral vectors, you know, HIV is hidden in so many different locations. I don't think that, you know, there's nothing right now that can even approach an in vivo delivery to all the different infected cell types. Um, one thing we have talked about is using this as something that you could use kind of in, in consult with uh, ex vivo manipulated cells. So, you know, you have CCR5 modification, you have expression of something like this, so that if for whatever reason they do become infected, then this would be like a kind of a backup thing for that. Um, but it's definitely something we are working on. Yeah. Along those lines, would it be different? It might be an advantage to knocking out a gene that doesn't inactivate the virus and makes the virus. Uh, sort of helpful for the immune system. So if you made a delta net virus in the process in the context of you're not going to hit all your viral genomes, but you might hit some viral genomes in such a way uh, that you're making virus that is actually useful uh, to the immune system. Is that my question? You don't buy that? Uh, to be honest, I haven't thought about that. Um. <laughs> <laughs> That, no, that, 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 that. Issue for HIV, so we've, we've really thought about that for some of the other viruses, like the herpes viruses we're looking at, that if you can allow partial reactivation expression of genes, you may have uh, improvement in the immune response without pathology. So, yeah, I, I think it's a great answer. Yeah, so you're sort of almost slowly creating the needle that's... It, essentially correct, right? So okay. make it help in that. HIV. Right, what, the one thing we know about Delta Nap is, is that, well, Maybe it tells uh, a bit. Turn gets too into it. But if you can hold it, if you block the cover activity, hold the virus on the surface of the cell, you do get an, uh, uh, a, more use, a more useful uh, immune response. <laughs> we should probably move on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, sorry for dropping that there. <laughs> Next up is uh, Bish Paul, and Bish will talk about a platform that we haven't heard too much about that combines the best of meganucleases and TALs um, into a protein called a megatal, and combining that with uh, insertion of uh, various kinds of drug resistance cassettes. Can you have your cell phone on you? No. I left it back. So is this just a yeah. forward? Awesome. Awesome. Uh, wow, that sounds loud. Um, my name is Bish Paul. I'm a graduate student in Hans Peter Kim's lab. Uh, I'd like to thank the Scientific Organizing Committee to giving me this opportunity to actually speak here, um, even though it's nerve-wracking, but I'm glad to be able to do this. Um, so today I'm going to talk to you about my thesis project, which is genome editing in CD4 T cells, and using this as a protective therapy against HIV infection. Um, so before this, we've talked about uh, hematopoietic stem cells, but my talk is going to focus on genome editing in CD4 T cells. The way that I'm um, approaching it is by uh, eliminating CCR5 receptor. So the Nuclease platform that I'm using um, is something that was developed uh, in collaboration with um, our collaborators at Seattle Children's and also at Bluebird Bio. It's a megatal nuclease, which combines the meganuclease with a tal effector domain. And the tal effector domain is basically DNA binding, and it just increases the specificity of the nuclease. To orient you, this is what the CCR5 locus looks like. I really liked Paula's analogy from yesterday, saying that it looks like the Loch Ness Monster. Um, so it goes in and out of the cell membrane. This is present on CD4 T cells. That's where our megatal nuclease binds and cuts. Uh, to give you, uh, to orient you, that's where the Delta 32 mutation exists. And uh, the zinc finger nuclease used by Sangoma Biosciences, this is the location where it cuts. So the big picture of what I'm trying to establish is to combine CCR5 gene editing and also targeted chemoselection in CD4 T cells, uh, with the hope being that we can take 
CD4 T cells out of an HIV positive patient disrupt CCR5 locus using megatau to get rid of these CCR5 receptors, expand those cells, and then reinfuse these HIV protected cells, which are now CCR5 null, into the patient. In more detail, the megatal will be delivered using uh, mRNA, using an uh, electroporation system, and gene insertion of a chemoselectable marker would be done using homology-directed repair. So the first question we had was, how well does the megatal work? So we tested it in a ghost cell line. The reason we used a ghost cell line is because, one, it expresses CCR5. Two, it tells us when HIV infects it. So here you're looking at data from several experiments which show us that when you introduce BFP control mRNA versus CCR5 megatal mRNA, in the CCR5 megatal treated cells, the CCR5 expression is um, eliminated very significantly. So the next question was, what does this do to HIV infectability? And so similarly, when uh, we took these cells and infected them with HIV BAL, we saw that the megatal treated cells were infected at a lower level, uh, and the level was threefold lower than the BFB control cells. So the next thing was, of course, to move into primary CD4 T cells, which is what we care about. Um, and uh, Andy has briefly gone over this. So uh, basically, we used the same protocol that our collaborators at Seattle Children's use. So we get PBMCs from human patients. We extract CD4, T CD4 cells from them using a bead separator. We activate them using beads. Then we transfect with megatal mRNA. And then we analyze it at various days after for both flow analysis and also molecular analysis to look at the levels of CCR5 that are being eliminated. So the flow data, this is what it looks like. The CCR5 disruption, as you can see, between the BFP control mRNA treated cells and the CCR5 megatel treated cells is remarkably different. And the disruption calculated by molecular analysis is 80% CCR5 disruption. Um, and again, to remind you, this is in CD4 T cells, primary CD4 T cells. So uh, the next thing we wanted to test is what would happen if we put in, if we challenge these cells with HIV. Uh, so we expanded these cells, took the CCR5 null cells, and challenged with HIV ex vivo, and put it into a humanized mouse model, the NSG mouse, more specifically. We adapted this protocol from Carl, Carl June's protocol uh, that was published in 2008. Uh, to summarize it, basically, we took PBMCs from patients, uh, activated them, and um, modified them, as I showed previously. At the same time, we also infected them with HIV BAL, ex vivo, and we then transplanted a mixture of infected PBMCs, fresh PBMCs, and the modified T cells into these mice, and then bled them at weeks one, three, and five and also collected flow cytometry data at those times. So this, these, this is the phenotype of the cells that went in. Uh, so as you can see, the cells that we modified, there was, again, an 80% CCR5 knockdown by flow. And these are the cells that went into the mice. And then we looked at it over day 7, 21, and 35 post-HIV challenge. So this is, again, quantification of flow data. We're looking at CD4 cells. Uh, when you look at day seven, you can see that there is no appreciable difference between the two cohorts. In the BFV control cohort, we had six mice. In the megatal treated cohort, we had seven. By day 21, you can see that there is a difference coming up. And by day 35, we were able to show that there was a hundredfold increase in the survival of CD4 cells. The next thing we wanted to look at was, OK, so the CD4 cells are being protected, but what does it look like um, when it comes to plasma viremia? Does the viremia in the mice go down? To answer that question, we used quantitative PCR analysis. And uh, this was a protocol from the Canon lab that we used. Uh, we looked at RNA copies per mil. At, and, and, and as you can see, at day seven, there is a difference, appreciable difference between the two groups. So the megatal protected groups had lower levels of HIV, circulating HIV. However, by day 21, started equalizing. And by day 35, 
both uh, groups were almost the same. Oh, sorry, were the same. There was no difference between them. So to explain that, I'd like to remind you that this is what the transplant looked like. There were 7 million modified cells, but there were 1 million PBMCs that were infected and 1 million that were just fresh PBMCs. So our hypothesis is that um, these two populations of cells that were not protected from HIV contributed to the viral increase. So the next step would be to, instead of having an ex vivo HIV infection, we would do the same thing, but have an in vivo HIV challenge later. So the next two things that I am currently working on, the first is to use chemo selection to preferentially select and expand the gene-modified CD4 T cells. And this, we're hoping, would give us higher numbers of HIV-resistant cells that we can then transplant into patients using a drug called methotrexate. The second is optimizing the same protocol in non-human primates, CD4 T cells, because the non-human primates are a very good model for an autologous transplant system. And that is something that the Keem Lab does really well. So the first, uh, uh, for the chemo selection part, uh, I've been adapting a protocol from the Jensen Lab. Basically, uh, methotrexate is a drug that arrests cell division by inhibiting DHFR. But there is a mutant form of DHFR that you can use that then uh, makes these cells resistant to lymphotoxic concentrations of methotrexate. So I used a lentiviral vector to deliver this into primary human CD4 T cells. And you can see that in the absence of drug versus in the presence of even a uh, drug as low as 0.025 micromolar, I'm able to select for cells to up to 90% purity. So what I hope to do with this is to use gene insertion. And this is, again, in collaboration with Seattle Children's. Um, so in, at SERI, they've shown that megatelnuclease combined with AAV delivery can give you up to 60% gene insertion. And so I'm not going to talk about this because this is going to be presented in session five by Guillermo. But the goal for my project being that I would insert the mutant DHFR at the CCR5 megatal cut site and then subsequently chemoselect these cells with methotrexate. Going on to the second uh, future direction, so uh, this is preliminary data showing that the megatal nuclease, the CCR5 megatal nuclease, also works pretty well in pigtail macaques. And again, you're looking at uh, percent cutting uh, in the BFP control versus megatal uh, treated cells, and we were able to show up to 55% CCR5 knockdown. In summary, what I've shown you today is that the CCR5 megatal nuclease achieves up to 80% disruption in primary human CD4 cells. These cells then survive active HIV infection in vitro and in vivo, and that we can use chemoselection strategies to preferentially select these cells. And also, lastly, the CCR5 nuclease platform achieves around 50% disruption in primate CD4 T cells. With that, I'd like to uh, thank our collaborators, Bluebird Bio, um, the Rawlings Lab. Most of the T cell work here that I've shown was done in collaboration with them, Guillermo, Andy, and Barry for the Megatel architecture. And this is my last slide for the community summary. And with that, I'll take questions. I have not been able to explain that phenomena. Do you, do you have a hypothesis? No. So have you selected for resistant virus? Hmm. So yeah, so that's one of the concerns. One of the concerns has been that you're selecting for uh, export of virus. Uh, one of the other uh, questions that we had was, if you look at a per cell basis, you have increased uh, CD4 compartment. Uh, and so 
Uh, you have a lot more, you know, if we have only monolithic modified cells, you have a much larger um, kind of infectable population that has a low level of HIV infection. So you could see an increase of overall infection because we see about 100 fold more TD4s in the, in the megatile treated cells. Uh, but yeah, one of, the, one of the big concerns right now is the sequencing and making sure that we haven't selected for a, for a CFTR for trip. A long time ago, I made a series of deletions to see if there are properties. Right. Uh, and one of the deletions that expressed and actually gave a little bit of expression was one where we deleted transmembrane right 7. And okay. it looks to me that the construct you're making is, is basically that construct. Okay. Um, so I, and so the question was, but then you're showing much lower expression that could be either due to the fact that you're, that does express lower, or your antibodies are actually right. Is it possible that there's still some basal level of this expression, or, or expression of this, this deleted form of CCR5? That's true. I've tested uh, the two different CCR5 clones of antibody that are present, and I've been able to show that those two are knocked down. The antibody shows that the CCR5 is not present. Yes. And the last question will be Jessica. Uh, perhaps this is naive, but if you were to think about putting this into humans, would it matter? It would. So Sangoma Biosciences has uh, shown that uh, there was one patient in their clinical cohort who was heterozygous for uh, CCR5 deletion, and that patient performed much better than uh, the patients who weren't. Uh, 